Good morning. My name is Patrick Brunden. I'm from the Van Andel Institute in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'd like to start by thanking Defeat MSA for organizing this meeting and for inviting me to speak to you remotely. I'm going to talk about possible disease mechanisms and research into potential treatments of MSA. And of course, this is a, an exciting emerging area with lots of activity. First, I just want to give some of my disclosures. Uh, I'm a consultant for some companies. I have some grants from companies and ownership in a couple of entities, and I'm also on a steering committee for a clinical trial. Today, I'm going to focus on three topics. First, I'll describe some potential cellular disease mechanisms. Second, I'll describe the possible origins of multiple system atrophy. And finally, I'll give you a a taste of what experimental therapeutics that are in the pipeline. So let's start with cellular disease mechanisms. And, and let me say at the outset that we don't know very much, but we're learning a great deal as we, as we continue to research in animal models and cell culture and in human tissue samples. We do know, and I think Dr. Lang summarized this earlier uh, this morning, we do know that alpha-synuclein plays an important role in MSA. It's normally a soluble protein that has some kind of function in nerve cells. And as I'm going to tell you later, maybe in other cells in the body too. It moves around inside nerve cells and under abnormal conditions, it can form clumps. In Parkinson's disease, these clumps, they're called Lewy bodies, they form inside nerve cells. And as you heard this morning, in MSA, the protein clumping actually takes place mostly in another cell type, the supporting cell type called oligodendroglia. The oligodendroglial cells, they actually have synuclein aggregates, and we don't really understand how they form them or why they do this. Normally, the oligodendroglial cells have very little alpha-synuclein in them, so something must go wrong. Now, this is what it looks like in the microscope. This is a paper by uh, the legendary neuropathologist, Kurt Jellinger, that he just published a few weeks ago, describing, you can see here, the brown stain in different brain regions of a person with MSA, alpha-synuclein clumps. It's interesting that the clumps that form in MSA are not just different in where they're located, compared to Parkinson's, being in oligodendrocytes in MSA and in nerve cells in Parkinson's, but they're also different in their biochemical properties. And this is just one example of a study that addressed this. So this is what it looks like when clumps form. You have the normal soluble monomeric form of synuclein. That means it's one molecule at a time. It will then, for some reason, misfold. And when it misfolds, it can seed the aggregation of other monomeric, normally unfolded um, alpha-synuclein. So the, the bad guy meets the good guy, it converts the good guy into a bad guy. So we have two bad guys. This is called a dimer. Then this process will repeat itself and you have lots and lots of these forming. We call them oligomers. And finally, they form large sheets, several oligomers together. And we call this amyloid. And these are the aggregates. And they're inside glial, so glial cell inclusions in multiple system atrophy, in oligodendrocytes. And somehow this leads to neurodegeneration. In this particular paper, they focused on this process a little bit more, the parts at the top of the diagram, and they asked the question, are the aggregates formed in Parkinson's disease and MSA different? So they took MSA, brain tissue, got some aggregates out of the brain tissue, put it into an artificial type of test tube environment, and then they also, in other test tubes and cell cultures, took Parkinson aggregates and put them together with the monomeric normal synuclein. They then followed this process of oligomerization, amyloid, and, uh, and aggregate formation. And what they saw is that the dynamics were very different. So here are the Parkinson data. 
These are different patient brains. And the higher up you come here, the higher the dots are on the diagram, the more aggregates there are. And you see that in some cases, there were aggregates coming from the Parkinson brain, uh, especially when you took the insoluble fraction that they prepared from, from the brain. If they took the soluble fraction, there were no aggregates forming. Totally different with MSA. The MSA was much more prone to cause aggregation. You see the dots are higher up on the MSA brain samples. So something is clearly different here. And we're trying to understand today why the MSA aggregates are so prone or, or the MSA synuclein aggregates are so prone to replicating themselves and seeding more aggregation. And just recently, there was a study where they used electron microscopy to study the aggregates from MSA brains. The study was published in Nature this summer. And they saw uh, lots of aggregates in a normal electron microscope, which was what one would expect. But with this particular study, they could use a fancy method to look at the highest level of resolution. It's called cryo-electron microscopy. And they could identify that the MSA type of aggregates were different to those in Parkinson's. So the structures of alpha-synuclein aggregates are different in MSA in Parkinson's. And as I said before, uh, they're particularly prone at seeding. And as I said at the beginning, they prefer to uh, seed and, and form these aggregates in the oligodendrocytes. So something is different to Parkinson's. So not only do aggregates appear in glial cells in MSA, there are other things that happen too. We know that these cells that are depicted in purple here, which are immune cells called microglia, they become activated. So they release all these little red balls out, which are pro-inflammatory mediators, things that cause inflammation in the brain. It's even possible to measure pro-inflammatory mediators or cytokines in the serum, in the circulation of people with MSA. This study that came out a few years ago from Sweden illustrated that a couple of these mediators called IL-6 and TNF-alpha were particularly elevated, even when measured outside the brain. And uh, the paper also concluded that inflammation might be involved at an early stage of MSA. And I'm going to come back to this later. So protein aggregates form, inflammation occurs. What else happens? in MSA. Well, the mitochondria, which are these yellow cigar-shaped things inside cells and produce energy, they also seem to be affected by the disease process. So there's some degree of energy failure in MSA. And as a result of all of these events, the protein aggregates, the inflammation, the connections between nerve cells are impaired, and we've heard this earlier today also, the myelin sheaths are destroyed, and eventually the cells die. So we do know something about what's going on in MSA, but why does it start? What's the origin of the disease? Well, you heard in Dr. Lang's presentation that there's a whole plethora of different symptoms in the disease, ranging from psychiatric, sleep, heart, things that occur obviously with movement, but even skin, uh, gut symptoms, and interestingly, urogenital symptoms. There are no known mutations that cause MSA. That's different to Parkinson's, where some rare forms of Parkinson's disease are actually coupled to mutations. So we don't get any clues from, from the genetics in that sense in MSA. Also, if you look at very weak genetic risk, these are studies called GWAS or Genome-Wide Association Studies, there are no clues that pop up telling us what the origin of the disease might be. There are also no clear environmental risk factors that we can say with certainty are coupled to MSA. But we do know, as I just mentioned, that inflammation might be involved in early MSA stages. So how could we then try to understand what the origins of MSA are? Well, we could look at the time course of clinical features. 
And whilst many people focus on the motor disturbances in MSA, the very earliest events are different. Even before having motor symptoms, most people who are diagnosed with MSA can recall that they had sexual dysfunction, urinary dysfunction, sleep disorder, they had problems with the blood pressure when they're standing up suddenly, autostatic hypertension. And we also know that the disease pathology spreads as the disease gets worse. And we do know where it tends to start. So we have some clues what parts of the brain are affected early and what parts of the peripheral nervous system are affected early. So perhaps we can learn about the origins of MSA by looking at what could be the origins of sexual dysfunction and urinary dysfunction in the disease. So what I'm going to talk about now is a is an early area of research. We haven't gotten that far yet, and we have a hypothesis that urogenital organs are affected early and could be one starting point for the disease process. The rationale is, of course, that urogenital symptoms occur early. MSA patients also frequently record, report bladder infections, which, of course, could be part of, of the nervous system failing there, but it could also be a sign that they've had this for a long time. We do know now, from the last year or so, that synuclein aggregates are prevalent in the bladder wall and the urinary sphincter. And we also have learned recently that synuclein aggregates can spread in a mouse model from the urinary bladder to the central nervous system. So we have this idea, our hypothesis is that, you know, urinary tract infections in most people, because most people will have this at some point in their life, uh, doesn't do anything, doesn't cause MSA. But in rare conditions, when there, for some reason, is an additional facilitating factor, which we don't know what it is, MSA will develop by this early event in the urogenital region. So let me explain some more details behind this hypothesis. There was a study that just came out this summer showing the synuclein aggregates in the bladder wall and the sphincter, that they're very prevalent, and that you can have spread of aggregates in a mouse model. It's this uh, paper that was published on June 26 from a Chinese group. Here are some pictures showing synuclein aggregates in the bladder wall and the urinary sphincter, and they compared people with MSAP and MSAC with people affected by Parkinson's, progressive supranuclear palsy, or normal controls. And you can see that it was a very common occurrence in MSA, and it was extremely rare or didn't happen in the other groups. So these were actually aggregates in nerve endings out here in the periphery. In the same study, they chose to create a mouse model where they were trying to replicate what they think happens in humans. So they injected synuclein PFFs, that is short for preformed fibrils, which are aggregates that you make in a test tube. And they injected these into the wall of the bladder of the mice. And lo and behold, all this brown stuff is synuclein aggregates that they found a few months later inside the central nervous system, far away from the injection site. So there was a progressive development of synuclein pathology in the central nervous system. And this is a depiction, a schematic, showing the injection here in the urinary bladder and the nerves that could carry these aggregates into the central nervous system and cause the spreading up the spinal cord to the brainstem and eventually to the midbrain. That's where the dopamine neurons are that succumb in many forms of MSA. So fascinating, this is still a mouse model. Now we've been interested in this because of these findings and uh, a postdoc working in my lab over the past couple of years together with another postdoc and student, I'm going to name them later, my postdoc uh, who started this is Wouter Perlitz, have been seeing if the ultimate trigger could be urinary tract infections. So we've been using uropathogenic E. coli bacteria, and we've infected mice with these bacteria. What we see is that synuclein is upregulated. So there's more synuclein in the bladder wall 
compared to uh, when we inject the bacteria compared to just injecting a control buffer solution. We've measured this in, in a couple of different ways. So there's lots more synuclein as a response to the bacteria. And when we look in a microscope, we see that some of this alpha synuclein, here it is stained in the microscope, is in the same location as something called myeloperoxidase, which is a marker for white blood cells. So remember, alpha synuclein is traditionally viewed as a protein that works or does something in nerve cells. But here, clearly, it's in white blood cells. And what we've learned during our studies is that, in fact, neutrophils, which is a special class of white blood cells, when they're killing E. coli, the bacteria, they release nets. And these are, are a normal molecular uh, trap that they release. And these nets actually contain synuclein. So Miguel Aguileta and Elisa Kaysen, the postdoc and the student who joined this project, have created a model in cell culture where they look at the release of these nets as the, animal, or as the cells, in this case just cultured cells, are exposed to bacteria. And lo and behold, here we see cells releasing these fibrous nets that also contain alpha synuclein, which is in this panel here. So, white blood cells, immune cells that deal with bacteria, can release alpha synuclein. And we're now trying to understand what all of this means. We're also seeing this sort of phenomenon in human bladders that have been inflamed for one reason or another. We see the synuclein and is right inside these white blood cells. So, urogenital dysfunction is a common early feature in MSA and synuclein pathology occurs in the urinary tract. And we know from the Chinese study that if you inject synuclein aggregates in the mouse bladder, it can propagate up into uh, the central nervous system. So this is all supporting this hypothesis. And, and we know that urinary tract infections in mice are associated with elevated synuclein, and white blood cells called neutrophils can release these in the so-called extracellular traps as they're trying to kill off bacteria. So these are ideas that support the hypothesis, but there's a lot more research needed to understand whether urinary or genital infections could be a starting point for MSA. So let me finish off during the last 10, 12 minutes with some experimental therapeutics. I'm going to talk about three categories. The idea that one can prevent synuclein aggregation, the idea that one can remove synuclein aggregates, and finally the idea that improving metabolism or reducing inflammation could be beneficial in MSA. So let me start with preventing synuclein aggregates. And there are many, many types of studies going on. I'm just going to highlight a couple in each category. There is a small molecule called, for short, ANLI-138B, which is quite a mouth mouthful. But it's been shown to interfere with the clumping of alpha synuclein. So you remember I told you before that the monomeric synuclein these are normal forms of synuclein, can form oligomers, and these can then proceed to form fibrils, so amyloid. This is a process that we don't like. ANLI can interfere with this, ANLI-138B. And a study published last year from an Austrian group showed that if you give ANLI-138 to mice that have a model of multiple system atrophy, you can inhibit the cell death that occurs in the substantia nigra, and you get improved behavior that is correlated with fewer cells dying. So these are, are uh, slips in the steps, motor dysfunction, but it, there's less motor dysfunction, um, or, or there's, there's better motor function if you rescue cells. And this is also associated with the reduction of phosphorylated alpha synuclein, which is this aggregated form. So ANLI-138 removes aggregates and improves cell survival. There's a company that owns ANLI-138B, it's called MODAG, and they have started first-in-human trials. And these trials have been done in healthy volunteers, and they just reported a month ago 
that there's excellent safety and tolerability with this drug and the levels in the plasma are high and they're now interested in pursuing this, of course, in multiple system atrophy. So that was a way of preventing the aggregation. How about removing aggregates that are already there? Well, using antibodies from the immune system, it's possible actually to remove alpha-synuclein as it is moving between cells. Because alpha-synuclein doesn't seem to stay just in the cell where it's formed. So aggregates seem to jump from one cell to another, be it a neuron or oligodendrocyte. So the idea is then to attack this synuclein when it's outside using antibodies that come from the immune system. And these antibodies will then direct the synuclein away from the nerve cell or from the glial cell into an immune cell, the so-called microglia cell. And here we're using the immune system to do something good. And a study published about five years ago showed in a mouse model of MSA that one could reduce the aggregates that are formed when treating with a vaccination protocol. So the mice were vaccinated in a way that they formed antibodies to the synuclein. And instead, the synuclein was directed into the immune cells. These, this is a marker for immune cells. There's lots more synuclein present in the immune cells as the immune cells were trying to get rid of it and degrade it. This has now led to clinical trials, both in Parkinson's disease and MSA. Uh, there's been a phase one trial in MSA that was completed a couple of years ago using a variety of vaccines from the company Aferis. They're called Afitope and they have a, a numerical code. So these have been shown to be well tolerated. They generate immune responses, which is what you want in this case, and it seems to be targeting MSA. Uh, in the case of Parkinson's, there was just this summer again a study reported saying that it is safe in a phase one trial, and they're now going to enter phase two. And we could probably anticipate that there'll be phase two trials also in MSA in the not too distant future. Finally, let me talk about improving metabolism and reducing inflammation. There is a drug called exenatide, which is, which is an agonist for a receptor called GLP-1. Exenatide was developed as a drug for type 2 diabetes to improve metabolism in people with diabetes. And we know now that it can improve metabolism in the brain and also reduce unwanted neuroinflammation in the brain. This is a very complicated diagram. At the top of it here, you see the GLP-1 receptor. All the events down here are molecular changes that occur when you stimulate the GLP-1 receptor. So giving a drug that affects this receptor does a lot of things in the brain, both in nerve cells and in oligodendrocytes, presumably, and in immune cells. The drug was tested a few years ago in Parkinson's disease, and in a paper published in Lancet Neurology by Tom Fulton, his, Fulton in his group, they saw that the patients didn't, de uh, didn't deteriorate as much as the controls when they received exenatide. Notably, when the treatment was stopped, there was still a significant difference between the placebo group, who didn't get any exenatide, and those who got exenatide. This was a study that went on for over a year. So this suggested there was actually a possible disease modification in Parkinson's disease when using exenatide. Now, this is not definitive proof. There's now a multicenter phase three trial just starting in Parkinson's disease to address whether this is really an effective therapy. But of course, Parkinson's and MSA share several features. And therefore, it's interesting to see if it works in MSA. And there have been recent animal studies just three years ago in a multiple system atrophy model showing that you can protect substantial Niagara dopamine neurons with exenatide in an MSA mouse model. As a result, recently, in fact, right now, a clinical trial is starting in London by Tom Fulton's group using exenatide in MSA. This trial will go on 
uh, in 50 patients, half will receive the active drug, half will be controls for a total of about a year. And there'll be an assessment of if there's a slowing of disease progression. Now, what is the future? I've given you three examples of potential therapeutic strategies. Well, the good news is that there are multiple targets. There are ways of targeting alpha-synuclein as it misfolds. There are ways of targeting alpha-synuclein aggregates when they're in the extracellular space, moving between cells. And there are ways of reducing energy def defects and reducing neuroinflammation, for example, with exenatide. But I think what the future holds is also that we will have to try to affect the disease earlier. So as Tony Lang said earlier this morning, it'll be absolutely essential to diagnose the disease as early as possible, perhaps using new biomarkers, and to figure out who's going to get the classical MSA before they actually have it. Then we can do the best, the greatest neuroprotection before the horse has left the barn, I think is what Dr. Lang called it. So with that, I want to thank the people who've done the work that I described in my group. I also cited a lot of other groups have done work, and I want to thank people who have funded uh, work related to uh, today's presentation. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you for listening, and I look forward to the Q&A session that will start later today. Thank you so much.